Okay, everyone. Hello and welcome um, to the seventh annual It's Your Turn Festival. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning for our virtual celebration of turns. Um, I'm Danielle Sherman. I'm New York City Audubon's uh, Education and Public Programs Manager. Um, I'm being joined today and assisted by Mally Adams, our Advocacy and Outreach Manager, um, Aurora Crooks, our Conservation Associate, um, and both of them should will be in the comments. Um, they can help you out and answer any questions you might have. Um, so if you do have questions or you're, you're having some trouble, just um, pop that in the comments and we'll try to help you out. Um, and uh, we'll be answering a few questions live later. Um, so you will have the chance to ask our um, scientists and staff some questions. Um, I want to thank you guys again for joining us. Um, we wish we could be out on Governor's Island with you celebrating there like we usually do. Um, but unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, um, we are uh, doing this virtually. Um, the Turn Festival was started seven years ago by our now retired Director of Conservation, Dr. Susan Elbin, and um, many other uh, partner organizations who worked with her to make it happen. Um, they wanted to celebrate the, the common turns of Governor's Island. Um, there was a colony out there. As far as we know, it is the only common turn colony in New York County. Um, so it was pretty special to us and we wanted to make sure to celebrate that. Um, and we'll actually be taking a virtual uh, look at that colony soon. So you'll have a chance to check that out. Um, we have a full schedule ahead. Um, we have lots of interesting turn information, turn activities. Um, so be sure to stick around until the end and you can check her knowledge with us with a Kahoot challenge. Um, but for right now, we actually have um, Aurora Crooks, who is our conservation associate. Make sure your volume is turned up um, so you can hear her. Um, she's going to be teaching us a little bit about these fascinating birds. So Aurora, if you uh, want to go ahead and take it away, let's learn a little bit about turns. Thank you so much, Danielle. I'm just going to share my screen really fast. So welcome to the 7th Annual It's Your Turn Festival. We're so happy to have you here. My name is Aurora Crooks. I am the Conservation Associate here at New York City Audubon. And today I'm going to be giving you guys an introduction to turns and turn biology super quick, just so you know why we're fascinated and why we want to celebrate this amazing little bird. Okay. So today we're going to be doing turn facts, turn biology, the importance of turns in conservation, and then some questions and just you can continue to ask questions throughout the presentation and throughout the chat and someone else will be able to answer them. I will be able to answer it at various points. And here you can see on the right or the left hand side, the various types of turns, which I will get into in a second. So the history of turns. Turns are little seabirds or big seabirds in the family Laridae that have a worldwide distribution, distribution and are normally found near the sea, rivers or wetlands. Um, their turns are treated in the subgroup of the family Laridae, which includes gulls and skimmers, which are like their cousins in a way, and consist of 11 general kind of different types of turns. All turns are generally going to have the scientific name of Sterna, which means that Sterna is going to be in front of their name in the animal kingdom or in the scientific terms. So the family Laridae, like any other family, there's a family tree and you can see where the kind of things branch off in their family tree a little bit right here. So the fun ones fi commonly found in New York are going to be the Forester's Turn, the Roseate Turn, the Least Turn, and the Common Turn, most of which are endangered or threatened. Um, but the closest cousin, what, their gulls, are tend to be thicker billed and stouter, while the turns are going to be sleek. They're designed for capturing really fast prey and um, are more predatory on fish and vertebrates, which if you've ever gone fishing, are kind of hard to get. So you're going to be want to you want to be evolutionary, literally designed to kind of go ahead and grab those really really fast. And the sterna are the common are the turns are going to be designed to be able to do that really really efficiently and really well. So 
Today I'm going to be really focusing on the least turn and the common turn, the sterna antelarum and the sterna horunda. And here you can kind of see their migration patterns or places where they commonly hang out most of the time. And it's really important to note that common and least terns are strongly migratory. They winter in south and in subarctic breeding ranges. And common terns, in fact, have some of the longest migrations of all birds. And an average round trip for migration for the common tern is around 35,000 kilometers each year. And if you don't know what 35,000 kilometers is, it's around 22,000 miles. So if you've ever ran a few miles or ran even a marathon, imagine doing 22,000 of those miles and you can feel like it's a, it's a pretty long trip. And these little birds do it all the time annually and most birds do it throughout their lifetime or most terns will do it throughout their lifetime. So you can see it here in the legend. And so, with that said, I am welcoming the call with the common turn or the sterna horunda or horundo. And here is kind of the anatomy of the common turn. So it's kind of important to know with the history of the common turn that in the early 1900s, common terns were almost extinct. And the reason that they were almost extinct is that they were being hunted for their plumes or their feathers very commonly um, in, by hunters in the early 19th and 20th century. Protective legislation in 1918 kind of allowed the species to really make a comeback and kind of allow their numbers to make a big increase throughout the, throughout the years. And today, the competition with ring-billed gulls and other, nests, and other bird nesting birds in New York City and upstate New York um, are reasons for the decline. But it's important to know that they really did almost go extinct at one point. And when we're talking about the anatomy, that they, they're quite a bit larger than a least tern, and, but they're smaller than a Caspian tern. So their, their average size, if you've never seen one in person, is somewhere between a robin and a crow. And then you can see their anatomy here that they have the solid black bill, the uniform gray black. It's important to know their little orange feet and their orange little tips and their beaks is important to know because it's a, it's a distinguishing feature beyond a, a number of different birds or a number of different terns. That said, I'm also going to be focusing on our least tern, which is our sterna anterallium. So these are kind of the smallest of the American terns. The least tern is gonna be found on nesting beaches, kind of the same as the common tern. And they're often found along the southern coast of the United States and on the rivers far into the interior of the continent. So the anatomy. Uh, the least tern is the smallest American tern. They're like least tern kind of, kind of fits their name. They're very, very tiny and they're small. They weigh around one ounce and they measure around nine inches in length. It's, um, I, they're identified in the spring and the summer by their white forehead that contrasts against their black crown and nape. And one important thing to know is that they're kind of yellow. They have yellow feet and yellow beaks compared to the common tern, which is a little bit different. So when noting the differences between a common tern and the least tern, you're gonna look at the color a common tern is going to be a lot more orange and a least tern is going to not only be smaller, but it's going to have that more notable orange beak and that orange feet. And here is a common, or least tern at least with its chicks. And you can see the breeding stages right here on the right hand side. So as I'm saying, the differences between common and least terns, common terns are going to be larger with going with the definition than least terns with a lot broader wings. The breeding adults have the orange bill, the fully black cap, the grayish underparts, and uh, common terns are going to have longer, more angular wings because they're very like, quick with the fishing, and it's a really, really important part of their courtships, like all terns, but especially with the common tern. And the tail is going to be forked and their legs are short. Um, and lifespan is also a very important thing to note with common terns. Common terns are going to be living up to 33 years, which is pretty, pretty long in the wild. And while least terns are going to live around 24 years in the wild. And so on average, the common tern is going to be 13 to 16 inches in length. And while, the, as I said before, the least terns are going to be around 9 inches. And they also have the distinct long pointed wings and the deeply forked tails. And so 
you might be wondering, well, you've talked so much about common and least terns, but what do common and least terns kind of eat? And that said, common and least terns mostly eat fish. They feed on a variety of small fish, whatever types are most easily available in that way. They eat crustaceans, also insects, also marine worms, sometimes even small squids, leeches, any kind of thing that they can find in the ocean and what they fish for. So they're scavengers in that type, but you're going to want to remember that their diets are primarily fish, but they also eat any other things in the ocean that they can find or whatever's, whatever's available to feed their young. And so here I'm going to be showing you the common turn fishing. And that's from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And you're going to want to note that like notable dive that they go into when they're fishing. And that's kind of how they, they seek out the fish or whatever kind of food that they're looking for. And then go for that notable dive in order to, and it becomes important later on because that's not only a behavior that's important for their feeding patterns, but a behavior that they use later on in their social interactions. So that said, here is a video of a common tern kind of feeding their chick. Breeding terns carry fish individually back to the colony to feed their, feed their babies or feed their young chicks. And while this wasn't the most successful feeding experience, if uh, chicks struggle to eat the food, the parents more, more often than not break up the food so that the baby can eat it. But you can see right there that the breeding turns, they are in pairs, the male and female are in pairs, and they work together to bring the fish to the child in order, to, so that, in order for them to eat it. Um, that being said, Male and female terns. Male and female terns, at least with the sterner horundo or the common tern, are almost identical in plumage and size, generally speaking. The one difference between a male and a female common tern are going to be the fact that they have males tend to have larger bills than their female mates. And this could be theorized that they need that for fishing because in their associative mating properties and in their courtship mating properties, they often need to present a big fish to the female in order to impress her so that she will accept their mating dance or accept their courtship proposal. So that could be a reason why. 
um, but they vary, there's very little difference between the two. The pattern is that there's, and they keep their partners from year to year. So once a male or a female turn decides to accept a courtship pr proposal, they keep that partner from year to year and raise their broods or nests together. So they establish pair bonds. And as I was saying previously, you can kind of see the way that they, the male presents the female, a fish in these kind of various different pictures. They, a male will, you know, try to find the most, the best fish possible and that is use that to present it to a female turn. And if she accepts, that means they are officially going steady. And from that point on, they will be raising their, their young children together. The usually the first breeds are around three or four years old and they usually perform these courtships at very high flights. They don't usually do it on the ground, they usually do it while flying, which makes it a specific kind of proposal. And then, then they build their nests, which are in shallow bits of soil, usually aligned with plant material or debris that they find on the beach or the shores or the wetlands or wherever they're necessarily landing. So as a result, usually they get these eggs they're one to three eggs, they're variable, they go from anywhere to a pale blue to an olive marked with brown and black specks. Incubation by both parents, which means both parents are going to be taking care of these young together, is around 21 to 25 days, so around three weeks, a month more or less. The young leave the nest after a few days once they're hatched, but they remain nearby and they are fed by both parents, as you kind of saw by the video previously. The age around first flight is 22 to 28 days. So shortly after, around a month after hatching, they're already kind of taking their first big flights, their first big steps, and they will remain with their parents, even if they do take those first flights for another two months, even more so, until they really get the, the knack of fishing and the knack of kind of navigating landscapes. And, and until that point, their parents will continue to feed them until they really get the hang of fishing and things like that as those things. So there's usually one brood to, per year, but sometimes they may have even two broods per year. That said, here are some nesting least turns. It's important to know that both parents incubate the chicks or incubate the eggs and the chicks to help feed them. They work together as a team and it takes juveniles some time to learn to plunge dive for the fish. So the parents continue to feed them until they really learn and get the knack of it. And only then will the parents kind of relinquish control and allow the turn, the young turn to kind of be by themselves. So you can kind of see the life t lifespan or the, the growing cycles of these young little terns as they go through their experiences here, as they look for fish together, as they grow up together and have their awkward little teen years up to until taking their first flight. Like I said before, they leave the nest after a few days, but they're gonna wanna remain nearby just because they don't have the knack of fishing quite yet. And they are gonna continue to be fed by both of their parents until they can kind of really learn. and they will stay with their parents for at least two to three, up to five months, most likely. Um, and there's one brood per year, like um, rarely two. And so I saw a question from Chris about what are some of the human impacted or human threatened, what 
kind of threatens terns from a human perspective. And least in common terns are considered a threatened species in the state of New York, which is one of the huge reasons why we raise awareness for this and why we kind of throw this kind of festival, not only to appreciate the natural beauty of this wildlife and these birds, but also because they are likely to become endangered or even extinct in for the foreseeable future like they were in the early 1900s. And we certainly don't want that to happen. And so numbers are on the decline objectively. And so some of the reasons for this, for this decline are objectively habitat degradation, which is from development, uh, climate change, which is climate change and human impact, which is you know, people riding their bikes or people just disturbing the wildlife because they can do that. So it's kind of important to remember that we kind of share our habitat and we share where we live with these species. And so we don't wanna really disturb them because if we disturb them, then their numbers will continue to be on the decline. And uh, human commercial predators, habitat loss from coastal development and rising sea levels are kind of the big main factors for their number declines. And there are about 40 to 50 breeding colonies on Long Island each year, and we continue to monitor their nesting success and their annual population index counts with the hope for more successful colonies and for in terms of conservation. And this data will help kind of know what management actions we can really take to make sure that these numbers are on the up and up so we can continue to have turns and kind of monitor their behavior and kind of see how fascinating they really are for as long as the days may come. That being said, thank you guys so much for staying with me and thank you so much for coming to our turn festival and please stay tuned for our next section, which is with Caitlin Parkins, our senior conservation biologist. All right, thank you, Aurora, for that. Um, I could watch videos of turns all day, um, but we do actually now have some footage of turns up next. Um, we have um, a scope and a, a camera set up at Governor's Island at the turn colony there that I mentioned earlier. Um, Governor's Island is just off the lower coast of Manhattan. Um, this turn festival was originally started to celebrate those very turns and over the years New York City Audubon has worked to study and preserve this colony with the help of staff at Governor's Island. Um, sadly, Jim Reed, a member of the Governor's Island staff who was crucial in these efforts, um, recently passed away. Um, he is missed by all of those who knew him, um, worked with him, um, and we in particular remember him as a champion for these turns um, along, along with his um, dog Max, who um, we all uh, got to know. Um, Max helped keep the gulls away from the turn habitat. Um, we just wanted to keep Jim in our thoughts um, as we move forward with this festival because he was such an important part of the work that we did um, to keep the turns thriving and also just such a wonderful um, person um, and a, a wonderful person to work with. Um, and um, so now um, I would like to um, welcome uh, senior conservation biologist Caitlin Parkins um, and our uh, bird guide slash volunteer um, slash jack of all trades Annie Berry, um, who has long been observing this turn colony um, and helped to found the festival initially. Um, Caitlin will be able to answer your questions, so you can put them in the chat and we'll get them out to Annie and Caitlin um, and they'll try to answer them as we watch the colony. Um, so yeah, take it away Caitlin and Annie. All right, thanks so much. Hey everybody. Um, so this is sort of a new thing for New York City Audubon, attempting to live stream our turn quality. If you're wondering, uh, Annie and I are out here on Governor's Island. Uh, we are looking out over the turn colony. I'm gonna get, give you a little scan. I've got my phone set up attached to a scope uh, to give us a nice view of the colony from a safe distance where we're not disturbing the birds. So I just want to give a little scan here. This is the Governor's Island Pier where this colony occurs. So uh, common tern colonies, uh, common terns usually uh, nest in New York City at least on our sandy beaches. Um, and in 2008 Annie actually came out and noticed a tern on one of these piers where uh, she started looking a little more closely and realized oh it has a fish and then oh it is going in and it's feeding a 
young bird. Um, so we've kept an eye on these piers and in 2013, it was the first time we were able to get out and band these birds with leg bands so that as they're seen and reported in the future, we can get information back on them. The following year, along with the Trust for Governor's Island and the Billion Oyster Project and Earth Matter, Earth Matter um, we were able to come out and use crushed oyster shells to sort of make the habitat a little bit better for the bird and make it somewhere that the birds would really want to nest. And the colony has been here since, and we've been coming out and counting nests every year, um, banding the birds. We've also used some um, geolocators and other migration tracking technologies to look at the local and long distance movement of these birds, um, which is really cool. So. I'm going to try to find some interesting things to look at here. So you can see here the birds on their nests. Their nests aren't made of very much, just a little scrape of shells and stones and kind of whatever they could find. And as you can see, this pier is completely uh, not accessible to people. And so Aurora was talking about like, what are the dangers to turns on beaches? Well, you've got people than off-leash dogs and predators, um, mam mammalian predators like foxes, feral cats, uh, even coyotes in some places. So all of these things actually aren't a problem on this pier. It really um, is a cool thing that they've been able to adapt here and the only predators they really have to deal with now are the gulls and occasionally the hawks which will eat chicks and compete with them for nest sites. Um, they're actually nesting a little closer to the center of the pier this year than usual. And we realize that's because there are gulls at the other end. So they've actually decided that they need, there's a little chick there for you to see. Oh, I'm gonna keep scanning, see who else we can see here. There we go. Does anybody have any questions so far? I saw one question in the chat. Let me see if I can flip over and see it while we look at this chick. Can you zoom in closer? The video isn't clear, so I can't get any closer, but what I can do is try to focus a little bit on it. Um, but somebody asked in an earlier, there we go. Yeah, what about the other chick? So here's another chick here. Um, what about the other chick? So when an uh, adult turn comes in, it catches a fish, it comes in with that fish, the chicks do a behavior called begging. So they're gonna run out and open their mouths and make as much noise as they possibly can. Um, and that begging behavior um, will, uh, the parent is basically most likely to feed the fish to the bird, the chick that has the most um, begging behavior, or the loudest beggar, essentially. And so the chick that is the loudest and the biggest and the strongest gets fed the most, which unfortunately means that, um, you know, sometimes if there's a third chick in the clutch, they don't actually get fed as much and they don't make it. Um, so usually it's that first hatched chick, the biggest, strongest chick that sort of gets the most attention from the parents. How many nests are at the site? How many nests are at the site? So uh, he, we think, Annie and I were actually just talking about this, we think there's about 30 nests at the site. So we actually can't access the site ourselves. Oh, this will be a good uh, view for another answer. Um, but in order to count turn nests, what we can do is count the number of adults. Um, and that's about the number of nests there are because remember you've got one turn, one adult taking care of the chicks back at the nest and the other adult is out foraging. And so if you count the number of adults at any one time, that's probably pretty close to the number of nests that there are. And we counted 30 adults. Um, so we think there's probably about 30 nests. Uh, how long until they fledge and are the chicks safer once they can fly? Yeah, the chicks are certainly safer once they can fly, although now they have like a whole host of other things they have to deal with, um, but they are still being taken care of their parents. But once they can fly, they're a little more likely to be able to get away from predators. Um, the chick you can see here in this video is probably about a week old, moving in towards two weeks. Um, they're going to spend about three-ish weeks, three to four weeks until they fledge. Um, and I was hoping to find a bigger chick for you. Let me see if I can find an older chick here in the colony anywhere. 
So here's another chick over here. This chick's a little older than the one I just showed you, probably into its second week of life. Again, I'll try to focus a little bit better. Cool. Ooh, there we go. Oh, there's a begging behavior. So that bird, that chick thought it saw its parent. It went out, it started begging, but I, I think it mistook another bird for its parent because it got ignored, unfortunately. <laughs> what kind of fish do they usually eat? They usually eat small fish. I know uh, Loyanne in her presentation later is gonna have um, mentions fish and she mentions butterfish. Um, I know that there are other, um, you know, small fish in the sea that sort of form the base of the food chain that are really important to them. And they also do, they'll eat insects, crustaceans. It's basically, they try to get whatever, whatever they can. Um, do they return to this site from year to year? And where do they go in the winter? That's a great question. There's some more begging here. Hopefully we'll get to see a parent feed one of these chicks over here soon. Um, so from year to year, site fidelity is pretty high. Um, the birds will come back, but if they aren't successful, they won't come back the next year. So if they have a couple bad years in a place, they'll start to look for another place. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, that can cause the decline in populations, which is probably what's going on in some of our other NYC beaches. They're not having good years, and so they're looking for other places to go and nest. We also, um, the technology we use to look at long distance migration to see that our birds are actually um, migrating all the way to Argentina in the, in the winter and then back here uh, to, to New York State, um, that requires light level geolocators, which is something we put out on the birds one year, and then we have to come back and we have to get the, those geolocators back off the birds. So we have to, you know, hope the geolocator stays on all year. Then we have to come back. Then we have to catch the bird a second time. And Loyan's also going to show pictures of how we uh, catch them. Um, and then um, we have to get the geolocator and like hope that it collected the data it was supposed to for that whole time. Um, so it's quite a process, um, but we put 10 geolocators out on turns two years ago, and last year we were actually only able to recover four. So some of our birds came back, some didn't. A fifth bird came back, but would just not go into the trap, and it was the most frustrating thing. Um, so yeah, they do often come back, but not necessarily. Let's go see if we see anybody else here. Ooh another baby there. Any other questions? Yes, so this, this is a little bit related. Um, how long do they live and do they continue to have young throughout their lives? Yeah, so I read that they can actually live up to 30 couple years into their low 30s, but I have also read, I'm going to go over a little bit, see if we can see these babies begging. Ah, they went behind the anchor. Um, but I've also read that the average life span span for a turn is only about 12 years. So they can live to be pretty old, but um, you know, they don't always make it that long. Do they have, continue to have young throughout their To my knowledge, they do. That's a good question. I, I don't know the answer, but as most animals are, um, their whole life is sort of dedicated to, to reproducing. And so I imagine that they do continue to have chicks. They do um, usually mate for life or at least stay with the same, same mate for a very long time. All right, I'm gonna take one more scan here. What a cutie. So yeah, there's our turn colony. Um, you know, we hope that next year uh, will be a more typical year and we can get out here and ban some of these birds and get our hands on and ban some of these chicks. And I hope you folks all enjoy the rest of the presentations and come out to Governor's Island when you can and look at the turns yourself. All right, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you so much for that, uh, Caitlin and Annie. Um, I have not been out to Governor's Island yet personally this year, so it was really wonderful to kind of feel like I was there and get to see the turns um, out there thriving, um, even though we haven't been able to kind of go out and check on the colony. Um, and it is, Governor's Island is now actually open to the public. So if you are in New York City, 
you um, can visit um, via the ferry um, and see the Turn Colony for yourself. Um, New York City Audubon will be out there ourselves from starting in August on the weekends. So we'll be at Nolan Park number 17. You can come by and say hi um, from a socially distanced um, stance. We'll, we'll have a socially distanced hi. Um, and uh, now let's take a deeper dive into bird banding. Caitlin talked a little bit about bird banding, but we have a little activity from Rachel Swanson, Outreach Conservation Educator at the New York Aquarium, where she'll uh, kind of show us a little bit about um, a little bird banding activity that you can do at home. All right. Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and I am the Outreach Conservation Educator at the New York Aquarium. Here in Coney Island, out on the beach right near the aquarium, we see terns all the time in the summer. Today, I'm gonna to teach you a really simple and fun activity you can do at home to pretend you are a scientist studying terns. This is a great activity for kids, for family members, or really anyone at any age. In order for scientists to help protect terns and other birds, they first have to learn as much as they can about those birds. Scientists can collect data on terns in a few different ways. They might measure them, measure how long their beaks are, they might weigh them, and they might also band them. What is banding? Well, bird banding is when scientists put a small metal or plastic tag on a bird. That tag might have special colors, letters, or numbers, so scientists know what specific bird that is. This can tell scientists a whole lot of information. They can learn where that bird might like to go and migrate to, where it might breed and lay their eggs, and a few other things as well. So at home, I want you to follow along with me to collect all of this sort of data from your turn at home. Okay, let's get started. For this activity, there's a few items you might need. First, you'll need a piece of paper and a pencil to record your data. You'll also need a recycled paper towel roll or toilet paper roll, or some string and beads. You should also have some marker or colored pencils, scissors, a ruler or something to measure with, and also something to weigh your turn. And last but not least, you're gonna actually need your turn. I just have a turn cut out, but you can use a stuffed animal or you can use a sibling, family member, or anybody else you have at home. First, you'll need to have your field journal or piece of paper with your name, date, and the data you want to collect. It's very important for a scientist to record all of their information. Make sure you include a name for your turn too. Next, you can measure the turn's beak using a ruler. If you are using a friend or family member as your turn, measure their nose. Make sure to record your data in your field journal. After, weigh your turn. You can do this on a kitchen or bathroom scale you may have at home, or take an educated guess. Record the weight in your field journal. Measuring and weighing the turn gives us information about the bird's size and age. Now it's time to create the band. Remember that the band needs to have distinct colors, numbers, or letters, so scientists can identify this specific bird. You can create a band using colored beads and string or wire, like I do here, to gently tie around your turn's leg. If you are using a friend or family member as your turn, you can use a toilet paper roll or paper towel roll. Cut it to your desired length, and then cut it down the center so it looks like a bracelet or cuff. Using markers or colored pencils, add some colors, and then gently place it around your turn's wrist or ankle. And don't forget to record all of this down in your field journal. Great job, scientists. Thank you everyone for joining me in learning how to be a scientist studying terms. The more we know about birds, the more we can help protect them and their habitats. Also, now you can look around your home for different materials to make bird bands out of. And don't forget to have your field journal and write down and collect all of your data. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. 
All right. Thank you, Rachel, for uh, sharing that activity with us. Um, someone asked, yes, we are going to be, uh, we are recording this and it will be up on our YouTube channel. So if, you know, um, you have any young people in your life that you want to share some of these activities with later, maybe, um, you know, uh, someone that you think would be interested, you can definitely uh, go to our YouTube channel where this will be posted um, and available. Um, all right, well, so now that we're, we've all been banded, measured, um, let's go to our next activity, which is from artist Autumn Quixote from While This Is Necessary. Um, Autumn has been New York City Audubon's artist in residence out at Governor's Island for several years now, and she's going to lead us through another fun activity you can do at home. Um, and in case you're curious, the music at the beginning of this next video is called There You Go by Lolly Hopwood. Um, it can be found on her album, Nice Things. All right, well, here we go. I'm an artist and a naturalist, and I'm the New York City Audubon Society's artist in residence on Governor's Island. So if you've ever been out to the house on Governor's Island, I'm the crazy little bird that nests away in the back of the second floor of the house. And um, today it's our virtual turn festival. So welcome to uh, the turn festival 2020 online. Um, and today for our virtual turn festival, I thought I would teach you guys a super simple technique um, to make prints of a common turn. And we can do this just using stuff that you have laying around the house. And I'm gonna show you one way to do it, but um, this is the simplest way, so I encourage you guys to experiment with other materials. Um, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna cut out some things and we're gonna lay them out and glue them to a piece of cardboard. So you'll need some cardboard and you'll need some scissors and kids get your parents to help you if you're gonna use the scissors and parents get your kids to help you if you're gonna use the scissors. Um, you'll need some glue and maybe a paintbrush, something to get the paint onto your surface, some paint. Now you don't want watercolor paint because watercolor paint is a little too thin. So you're gonna wanna use something like an acrylic water-based paint. That being said, it is paint, so don't wear your favorite suit when you make this project because if you get it on there, it's not gonna go off, even though it's water-based. Um, what else? You need um, anything else you wanna add texture. I used uh, a cereal box to add some extra layers. So this is just, you know, a cereal box like this, a pasta box. But you can also go outside and get some things and try with seeds or um, bark maybe, or even sand, I don't know. Try different things. When you see this, you'll understand. Even stuff around the house, like uh, tin foil or plastic wrap. See what you can do. And if you wanna get super fancy and you wanna seal it so that you can keep using this, because we're gonna make a stamp, so you wanna make more than one, right? Um, I have this fancy little Mod Podge that has a glossy finish. So if you put that over top of it, it'll seal it all down and it'll make it last a little longer, but it's not totally necessary. So I have a little video here of how I put together my pieces. You can see all of the pieces that I drew. I got a picture of a common turn and um, I made those three pieces and I cut them out and then I cut some out of cardboard and then I glued it all down onto another piece of cardboard so it was nice and heavy and solid. So that is super easy. Draw whatever kind of turn you want. You can look at my turn and go with what I did, but I encourage you to Google pictures of turns because there's all kinds of neat looking turns that are different shapes and in different positions. And it might be neat to experiment with putting clouds in the sky like I did on this one that you can see here um, with napkins. Um, but the one I'm gonna show you today is um, the simplest version. So this is after I put it together, you saw me gluing it just now. This is what it looks like all together, and you can see I printed it once already. It's got some paint on it. So you can see this is the cereal box here, and some cereal box here, and this is all cardboard. And then I covered it with that shiny Mod Podge, um, just to make it last longer so I could show you guys how to do it. So it's really, really simple. All we're going to do, and I'm going to use some bright pink ink just so you guys can see it really well, but um, you can break it down and do all different colors. You can do whatever you want. But I have this paintbrush to use with my paint, and this is a stenciling brush. 
you can use any kind of paintbrush or a sponge or anything. And I'm just gonna, I put some paint on this little thing here, this other piece of cardboard, scrap piece. And I'm gonna get a lot on my brush. And then I'm gonna take my little guy here and I'm just gonna dab it all over. So you guys can see, like if I wanted to do the turn, the actual color of a turn, which would be kind of gray and white and black, I could, and, and his red bill, I could just do those parts in that color, but today I'm just gonna do this. So I'll real quick do that. We'll get it all covered in it. Okay, so it's all covered in paint. You can see it's covered in paint. And, um, and I have some scrap paper here. Now you guys should always test print on some scrap paper first, just to see um, how it looks. If you need to add anything, take anything away, put more paint, less paint. So this is just a test print. We're just gonna see what it looks like. I'm gonna lay that paper down on top of my, um, my little stamp, my little turn, and I'm gonna rub it. And I'm gonna rub it not too hard. You don't wanna put too much pressure, but you wanna put enough pressure that you can feel all of the little ridges of any texture you put on there. So I'm gonna rub it enough so I can just feel every part of my turn. And then when you're done rubbing, and you feel good about it, just peel the paper off and check out your image. So that is my test print of my common turn. Um, and I hope you guys have a lot of fun playing around with this. And if you want to, you can even send me your pictures of what you make. I'll put my email address in the bottom. And um, I would love to see what you guys make and I'll, maybe I'll even put them up on my website. So I hope that you guys enjoy the rest of the uh, virtual turn festival and I hope everybody's staying safe and have a great day. Bye. All right. Um, if you enjoyed Autumn's activity, be sure to visit her at her website, um, which I think Molly dropped in the comments section, wildnessisnecessary.leadly.com. Um, she has a lot of great stuff there that you can check out, um, other videos and, and fun things. Um, so next up on our list is our friends over at New York City Parks Department. Um, we have already talked a little bit about um, sharing the shore with turns, um, but they're going to just go into that a little bit more um, and talk about how to protect turns and other beach nesting birds. Hello and welcome to beautiful Rockaway Beach. I am Sunny Correa from the New York City Parks Wildlife Unit. Our unit promotes coexistence between people and urban wildlife. Our work involves research, management, educational outreach, and policy recommendations. I am here in Rockaway at the site of one of our management projects, the Rockaway Beach Endangered Species Nesting Area. Since 1996, New York City Parks has been protecting endangered shorebirds that nest on the south side of the Rockaway Peninsula. Several threatened and endangered species use this area as a breeding ground each summer. Today we are celebrating the terns, but joining the least in common terns nesting here are also piping plovers, American oyster catchers, and black skimmers. Already today you have learned lots about terns. You may be asking yourself, what can I do to help? Well, I'm so glad you asked because now it's your turn to support shorebirds all over the city. I will be sharing five simple coexistence tips which I hope you will undertake and share with your family and friends. Number one, share the beach. New York City has over 14 miles of beaches to enjoy. In Rockaway alone, New York City Parks cares for over six miles of publicly accessible beach. If you are walking along a New York City beach or shoreline, you may come across areas that are fenced off or temporarily closed. Here at Rockaway Beach, approximately one mile is fenced off for nesting shorebirds each summer. This way, chicks can have access to the shore to feed and do not have to worry about avoiding people or the vehicles used in beach operations. We use symbolic fencing at our site in Rockaway. Brightly colored string and flagging with signs is used to notify visitors when they are approaching a protected shorebird nesting area. You will find similar signage in other protected breeding areas. Please respect these sensitive habitats along the shores of New York City and choose to use other areas of the beach. Not only will you be protecting the birds, 
but you'll also spare yourself some trouble as well. Remember those terns? They are very protective and territorial during the breeding season. This is the view our monitoring team experiences on the few occasions when they have to walk into the middle of the Rockaway breeding site. Terns are colonial nesters that lay their eggs directly on the sand. By nesting in large numbers, adults assist each other in watching out for threats. They will mob and fly after anything they perceive as a threat. Other birds, mammal predators, and even people, so watch out! Not only will they dive at you, they may also try to poop on you. The ultimate predator deterrent. Who wants to get pooped on? Number two, observe and enjoy all shorebirds from a distance. This is a good general guideline when out anywhere on the beach. During this time of year, adults are working extra hard to raise and protect their chicks. So lend them a hand by observing from afar to avoid adding extra stress to their day. Give them space as you would any other New Yorker. Number three, help keep the beach clean. Food or garbage left out on the beach attracts predators such as rats, cats, raccoons, and gulls. We don't want to attract them into an active breeding area. Garbage items can also be a physical hazard for birds as it can be mistaken for food. Animals can also become entangled in it. So the next time you visit the beach, Make a pledge to leave it cleaner than you found it. On your way out, pick up a few pieces of litter the wind or tide may have carried in. Challenge your friends to do this too. You can also protect the beach at home by keeping your neighborhood clean. Litter left on the street can potentially be washed out to the ocean through storm drains during rainstorms. Number four, keep dogs leashed and follow local regulations. Rockaway Beach prohibits dogs on the beach and boardwalk Memorial Day weekend to October 1st. Check your local beach to learn the regulations. In New York City, visit the Parks Department's website to learn more. Terns and other endangered shorebirds view even the most friendly of dogs as predators, which may cause them to abandon their nests. Number five, keep kites at least 200 meters away from breeding shorebirds. 200 meters is equivalent to a little over four New York City street blocks. The nesting adults may see a flying kite as an aerial predator. They might seek out this potential threat, leaving eggs or chicks momentarily unguarded, or abandon their nest altogether. So just be aware of your surroundings before setting out with your kite. That's it! These coexistence tips are simple adjustments we can do to change our behavior. Oh, and one more important tip. Number six, share your knowledge with friends and family everyone can do their part. You can learn more about the urban wildlife living in New York City by visiting the Wildlife NYC website. There, I encourage you to take the online pledge to coexist with all New York City wildlife and become urban wildlife ambassadors yourself. Thank you for watching and doing your part to support the birds. Now it's your turn. You got this. All right. Um, well, that was just a little bit of um, beach conservation, turn conservation information for you all. Um, and thank you to Sunny and to New York City Parks Department for putting that video together uh, for this festival um, so that we can uh, spread this important message. Um, if you have any particular questions about this issue or um, the Share the Shore initiative, um, Molly Adams has um, done a lot of work on this particular topic with Sunny also, um, so she can um, try to help answer some of your questions in the comments if you want to put them there. Um, and next up, we have um, an exciting turn puppet making uh, workshop. We're going to learn how to make a very simple, nothing too elaborate, but a simple turn puppet um, with uh, Sedwin Hooks from Ibex Puppetry. Ibex um, is dedicated to promoting health and healing for the planet through the fine art of puppetry, and we've worked with them quite a bit out on Governor's Island over the years. Um, Sedwin is an incredibly talented puppeteer and puppet maker who has worked on projects all over the world. Um, we're so thankful to him um, and to Ibex Puppetry for this workshop. Um, and we are going to drop the template for the puppet in the comments section. Um, so you can use that 
um, if you want to do this later, um, or um, he, he also will kind of show you how you can do it um, without the template, um, since most of us don't have access to printers at home and all that sort of thing. Um, but here we go. All right. Hi, my name is Sedwan Hooks and I make puppets for a living. Today I'm going to show you how to make a paper turn puppet. All you're going to need for this is some construction paper, or regular paper, whichever you like, a stick, because it's going to be a stick puppet. It'll be a little paper bird on a stick that we can play with. Or if you don't have a stick, like here we have a dowel, you can also use a popsicle stick or a pencil. Uh, just use a different pencil to draw with because you'll need your pencil to draw with if you like. Um, some scissors and some glue and some markers to put some color to the character. For this craft you'll also want a bit of tape. I'm going to start by showing you how to draw the parts for this craft. Um, you can either draw them or print out uh, the sheet that we've provided in the link. Uh, if you don't have a printer, however, you can follow along with me and uh, I'll show you how to draw the character for yourself, okay? Let's get started. Alright, so for those of you that can't print out uh, the sheet that we've provided, we're going to draw the turn. And it's fairly simple. We're going to start with an oval. It's a little fat body for the turn. We're going to put a triangle on this end. See that? I'm going to add a long point to this end. That will be the tail. Here in the beak, we're going to add a line. Right here, that's the mouth. Then we're going to take a line from here to here and from here to here. Connect that. There's your beak. Now we're going to erase this line and this line. And we're going to add an eyeball here. See that? And up here on the top of the head, there's just a shock of color. So I've added that. So there's the body for the turn. Now we have to draw the wing. And the wing is pretty simple. It's just a line going off at an angle, like that, and then a bend. You see that? That's your angle. And then you come down here, you do that to complete the wing. See that? Then we're going to draw a straight line here at the bottom. There's your wing. Now when you draw your wings, you want two. And I'm going to draw one going in the opposite direction so that we have two wings. So same thing. Go off at that angle. Keep the wing like that. So there's your other wing for the other side. So next up we're going to draw the feet. And the feet are really simple. We're just going to draw a little strip here. There's your strip. Then we're going to add the foot on the bottom. And the foot is round over here. We've got a point, another point, and that point. And that's how you draw the foot. We'll draw one more. Awesome. And that's how you draw all the parts for the bird. Now, before I put my bird puppet together, I'm gonna take the time to color this little character here. So let's get out our markers, whatever colors you like, and we'll add some color. Now you can color your turn however you like, but I'm gonna color mine. Uh, I'm gonna try to be accurate with how I color mine. Wow. 
voila, there's my colored page. All right, so now that the turn is colored the way we want it, we are gonna get our scissors and cut out these pieces, okay? Be very careful to turn your paper, not your scissors while you're cutting. All right, let's get these cut out. All right, so now that all of our pieces are cut out, you've got the body for the turn here. You've got your little legs cut out. There they go. Little legs, and we've got our wings cut out. Okay, so our next, our next task is to glue. If you look, on the paper, I've provided some dotted lines for you. And those of you that drew at home, this is where you're going to want to fold. Okay? So fold on these dotted lines if you drew at home. Fold at the bottom of the wing if you drew your own. Okay? So now we've got a fold down at the bottom of the wing. Do the same thing here on the other wing. Then we're going to apply some glue. And where we're going to apply the glue is on that little strip that we folded here. See? The glue goes right across there. So I've added glue to that little strip. Now we're going to glue it to the body. On those, uh, within those dotted lines is where we're going to glue. Now, when you glue your wing to your turn's body, you want to make sure that this bend is facing where the tail is. You want the bend to be facing this way. Great, so we've got the first wing on. Don't glue the second one on the other side yet. First, we're gonna glue one of these legs on. So again, where you see dotted lines, you're gonna wanna make a bend. And right where that dotted line is. And we're going to use that flap that we just bent. We're going to apply glue to it right across there. And we're going to glue. We're going to take that bend, bend it all the way to the back, you see, and glue to the body. So now that our body has both the wing and the leg glued to it, we're going to tape our rod to the back, our stick, popsicle stick, whatever you have. I'm going to use a piece of gaff tape here, but you can use scotch tape or masking tape, whatever you have there at home. Add that to the top of the stick. And where I tape the stick is going to be below where that wing attaches. So on the other side of this paper, I'm taping the stick right below where the wing glues on. So on the flip side of that, let's see. You see where I have taped the stick is right below where our other wing attaches so that we can still glue our wing in place. So now that the stick is attached, we're gonna glue the other wing in place. And if you'd like 
to attach your other leg. On this side, you can take another piece of tape, the one you just used, put it on the top of your leg there, and tape it on to where the stick is. two legs. Our turn has wings and you have your puppet that flaps. Here's your little paper turn puppet. I hope you've enjoyed doing this craft with me. I'm Sedwan Hooks. See you next time. Well, thanks again to Ibex Puppetry and uh, Sedwan uh, for putting together that video for us. Um, if you do end up making your own turn, turn puppet at home or, you know, you have a, a, a young person who makes one, um, you can share it with us and with Ibex Puppetry on social media. We would love to see what you uh, put together. Um, we are at NYC Audubon on Instagram and Twitter and Ibex Puppetry is at Ibex Puppetry on uh, Instagram and Twitter as well. All right. Well, now, next up, we are going to hear from Loyanne Beausoleil. Um, Loyanne is the Bird Programs Manager at Washington Square Park Eco Projects. Um, and she's a volunteer, not just with NYC Audubon, but also out at Great Gull Island. Um, that is an island about five or six miles off the tip of Long Island. It's kind of a, a, a cool spot. Um, you should look it up on Google Maps. I, I think it's fascinating. Um, Loyan is going to tell us a bit about the unique experience of working out at Great Gull Island um, and the important research that is being done out there. Um, all right, so if we can get Loyan to uh, join us. Oh, thank you, Danielle. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everybody um, so you can see a little bit about what um, we do out at Great Cole Island. Okay, so um, I am so honored to volunteer out at Great Cole Island. It's a really special place. Um, like Danielle said, it's located in the Long Island Sound. Um, it has a really interesting history. It was taken by, from the turns by humans uh, to be changed into a military fort, Fort Nietzsche, from the late 1800s until um, about 1946. Uh, and then at that time, the military dis disarmed it. And in 1949, the, the American Museum of Natural History um, bought the island with the hopes of establishing the historic turn colonies. And the photo on the left is an overhead view of the island. You can see the fort and the photo on the right is called Big Gun. And it is one of the gun batteries out on the island. Okay, so in 1969, um, the Turn colonies, um, I'm sorry, in 1969, direct management of the colony began, began under the direction of Helen Hayes, and she has been responsible for managing the colony for over 50 years now. Her work is considered instrumental for increasing common and roseate turn breeding populations. Here's a picture of Helen. Um, she's considered one of the famous women in North American ornithology, and I love this picture of Helen because here she is in the field and she's wearing one of the very famous Great Gull Island flower, flowery hats. And the reason we wear these hats out at Great Gull Island is because um, the terns are attacking you all the time and they're going for the highest point and they're going for blood. So that's typically your head. And Helen over the years learned that um, the terns, uh, when they attack you, they'll, they'll go for the highest point. They used to wear hard hats to protect their heads, but then she also learned that that hurt the terns' beaks. 
So this method of protection was developed and the terns then go for the flowers. The terns aren't hurt, the peoples aren't hurt, and it is the fashion statement out at Great Gull Island. Okay, so when I go there, people often ask me what it's like. And um, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of turns there, as you can see from this photo. And so when you get off the boat, the common turns immediately begin attacking you and pooping on you. And you have to watch your step, every step you take on the island, because nests and chicks and eggs are everywhere. There's no running water, there's no electricity on the island. Everything has to be brought onto the island or taken off the island by boat. The lodgings are incredibly rustic. On the left, here's one of the bedrooms at Great Gull Island, and that's in an old military barracks. That was one of my bedrooms. And um, it's actually a much better bedroom than my bedroom in New York City. Um, and then on the right, here's one of the pit toilets we use. And as you can see, there used to be a stairway that ran up to one of the gun batteries. And at the top of that stairway are nesting common turns. And so when you're trying to have a private moment um, using the bathroom, the turns are frequently um, loudly complaining about you being there. And every once in a while, a baby turn will tumble down those stairs and somebody has to uh, rescue it and scramble back up those stairs and bring it back to their parents. And there is a fence at the top, so that doesn't happen that often. Okay, another thing about being out there is it is incredibly loud. The common terns vocalize all day and all night. And there are typically nine to 10,000 breeding pairs of common terns. Um, and that means that at any given time, there are at least 18,000 common terns, and that's not including the chicks, that are um, yelling at you all the time. And here's some photos of terns um, vocalizing. It's so loud that some volunteers wear noise canceling headphones. So what do the volunteers do? Well, there's numerous things we do. In the spring, we're marking nest sites and we're recording the number of eggs in each nest. This is done in a very systematic way. The island is mapped out on a grid and all the volunteers line up in a straight line and walk systematically in a straight line, marking with GPS and then physically marking with a popsicle stick every nest they find along their line. And we crisscross the island this way until we've marked as many nests as we can possibly find. We also ban chicks and the data is recorded. We also trap, weigh, and measure common turn adults. On the left is a picture of an adult that's been trapped and we do this by putting the traps down on top of a nest with a chick in it and then when the adult brings food to the chick um, the door closes and then the adult here is waiting patiently to be processed and on the right, here I am at base camp, and I've got a turn in my hand um, that's just been processed. It's been weighed, it's been measured. If it's an adult and it's not banded, it's been banded. It's getting ready to be released back to its family. Another important thing that we do out there is we're trying to identify the male and female um, in paired turns. And I know Aurora talked a little bit about how it's hard to tell them apart. So one of the ways we're able to tell them apart is by watching them copulate. And we can read the band numbers as they're copulating. And if, if the, that way we can get a lot of information about the pair and um, we can associate the pair with a nest number and with the chicks. And the more information we can get about them, the better. Another thing going on out there that's really interesting to me is a feeding study. And we're watching to see what kind of food the adults are bringing into their chicks. We're looking at the frequency, we're looking at um, how, how many fish, what kind of fish, and this can tell us so much about what's going on in the Long Island Sound. For example, in the middle picture, you'll see that turn has a really beautiful, rich, oily butterfish, and that's gonna be a really good meal for a chick. On the right hand side, that turn has some weird crustacean and that's not quite as nutritious or high quality for a chick. So 
we can see if the terns are bringing in high quality food, um, how frequently, because if they're not bringing in fish very frequently, it means they're probably having to travel a longer distance to find food or that the fish are not very abundant. Okay, so um, Great Gull Island is run by volunteers. Helen Hayes directs it, but she depends on volunteers and she is incredible at mentoring people, welcoming people and getting volunteers out there. And if this is something you're interested in learning about, um, right now, because of the pandemic, we're not able to get out there, but hopefully we'll get to be out there soon. There I am on the far right, right next to Helen Hayes and New York City Audubon's Molly Adams is in that picture too. Um, as you can see, uh, we'd like to have more black, indigenous and people of color joining us out there and working out there. So if anybody's interested, um, my email is there, you can contact me and I can help you with that because the success of common terns at Great Gull Island depends on volunteers. And there are just some cute, cute chicks to say thank you. Oh, um, thank you so much, Lyanne, for joining us. Um, that it was great to have you come and tell us about the work that you're doing. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that some of you will be able to uh, volunteer and get out there yourselves. Um, so now um, we are going to learn about some different turn research. Um, we uh, have a presentation. Unfortunately, she's not able to join us live today because she's uh, doing some interesting work on storm petrels, but we have um, a researcher who works with terns all the way over in the Azores, uh, Veronica Nevis from IOMA Azores Seabird Institute, um, would like to share with you all a little bit about the work that they do out in the Azores. So let's learn about that. Hola, my name is Veronica and I am connecting from the Azores Islands. I'm happy to be part of this year's festival and I'm very grateful to New York City Audubon and to Molly Adams for inviting me to participate. So today I'll be telling you a bit about the Azores common terms. I'm sure you all know where the Azores is located, about halfway between Europe and North America. Nine islands spread over 600 kilometers in the ocean. The Azores actually is the most oceanic breeding location for the common tern anywhere in the world. I really like this image. It was taken by a friend a few years ago in the Azores, and it really shows the special bond between parents and chicks and all the effort and care and love that goes into raising and creating these wonderful winged creatures. In Portuguese, common terns are known as garajal comum or andorinha do mar comum. Andorinha means swallow, and terns are indeed our swallows. When they arrive by late March, early April, we know spring is on its way. Terns can be quite challenging to study and monitor in the Azores. There are over a hundred colonies, some very inaccessible, like these small stacks, rocky islets, some with more vegetation, cliffs by the coast, rocky boulder beaches, landslides, and even some inland colonies in some of our freshwater lakes. We have a lot of uh, uh, predators, introduced mammals brought by the Portuguese, rats, mice, hedgehogs, cats, Indeed, our only endemic and native mammal is the Azorius bat, the diurnal Nyctalus azorium. We also have aerial predators, and from those, starlings are undoubtedly the ones that are causing more disturbance. They can predate hundreds of turn eggs in a, a breeding season. So what do we know from the wintering grounds of the Azores common terns. The first information we had was from a ringing recovery in 1993 of a common tern ringed the Azores and later recovered in Brazil. 
Since then, there have been over 50 ringing recoveries of birds that were either ringing the Azores and recovered in South America or ringed there and then later recovered here breathing. Um, uh, Helen Hayes from the American Natural History Museum has done a lot of um, ringing effort in South America and teams from the Natural History Museum have also been over to the Azores several times to ring birds here. So there's been a lot of collaboration work between the years between the Azores and, 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 and Helen Hayes. And in 2011, we set up to study the migrations of common terns in more detail. For that, we selected an islet, Praia Islet, a very accessible islet. It has a small support house. Uh, in the 90s, there was a huge recovery uh, project in the islet, and uh, turns increased over the years. And when we conducted our studies, this was the largest colony of turns in the Azores, with several hundred pairs of common and rosy turns. So adult breeding common turns were captured in their nests. The birds that actually went into the traps were marked with these devices, geolocators. locators. They have a light sensor and a clock. Uh, they are relatively cheap. They do not seem to cause impact, a severe impact on birds. Other studies have shown that birds carrying geolocators locators for a year don't seem to have a lower survival rate that uh, compared with birds that don't have geolocators, they also seem to come back to the colonies approximately on the same times. So they are relatively cheap, easy to use, and they, they have several advantages, very good little devices. They do have some disadvantages, they are not very accurate, so um, especially in the equinoxes, the, the error in the location can be quite large. But when one is looking at large scale migrations, that isn't really so important. The other disadvantage is that you have to recover the birds in order to be able to download the data. They don't transmit. So in 2012, we came back to the island, very excited to recover the first geo locators, but unfortunately, there was a problem. In 2012, the levels of predation by starlings at Praia Island were very high. And how do we could recite? Over one third of the geolocated birds, we could only capture two. Uh, many of the other birds, their nests were being predated before we could recover them. We know that birds can change colony if there's a predation in event in the Azores. There are several other colonies available. So we went to the closest um, accessible colony that was about 80 kilometers away in Terceira. And there we could sight and recover another logger bird. So in total, we got three loggers, a very small sample size, but still uh, they gave us some indication on the birds' behaviors. And here you have a figure showing what the geolocated birds did. In yellow is a male, and then red and black, two females. So uh, the birds departed the breeding grounds at different times. The, mer the males uh, left the colony later. That was also observed for the birds in North America, maybe because the males stay behind to give support and help to the juveniles. And then they did this migration uh, in about a week from the Azores to the coast of Brazil, traveling on average 500 kilometers a day. So the birds from, from North America are doing slower migrations. They have the opportunities to stop along the coastline, to rest and to feed. Birds from the Azores have to do a much more uh, quick and direct flight to the wintering grounds. The males spend all of the winter in just one area. The females uh, had a stopover in the mid uh, coast of Brazil and then went further down to Lagoa do Peixe and to Argentina to spend the winter. Um, Finally, as a resume, we have a map here showing what is known so far from common turn migrations from geolocator studies. So birds from continental Europe are using this East Atlantic flyway and spending the winter in the west coast of Africa, whilst birds from the Azores and North America are uh, using the coast of South America. Interestingly, we also have rosy turns breeding in the Azores, and although we have not conducted a geolocator study, we do have some information from rings. There's much less ringing recoveries for rosy turns, but still they indicate that birds can use both sides of the Atlantic and winter either 
in the West African coast or in the South American coast. Now, we don't know if the same individual can use both areas or if a part of the Azores population is using one area and the other part another, but there's definitely a lot to, to find out and to study about the trends in the Azores in the future. I thank you very much for your attention. I apologize I wasn't able to be online, but I am currently at Praia Island studying storm petrels, so internet is not so stable. But I thank you very much for your attention and I wish you all a great festival. All right. Um, well, thank you so much to uh, Veronica for putting together that presentation for us and sharing some of the work that's being done in a different part of the world um, with turns. Um, we really appreciate that perspective. Um, all right, well, we're, we're getting near to the end of the festival. We're a little bit behind, but um, if you all are ready, um, it is now your turn um, to test out what you've learned today um, with our turn Kahoot challenge. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, if you haven't used Kahoot before, um, all you have to do is go to kahoot.it um, or um, there's an app as well, but if you're just on your phone, you can go to kahoot.it. Molly will put that um, little URL in the uh, comments. Um, and you're going to use this pin here that you see um, to join our um, so it's just 572-2120, and that'll let you join our game. And I'm going to give you all a little bit of a chance to uh, join. I'm being told it's a Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you all the chance to join in on that. Give you a chance to get on. You can use the phone. Um, I think that might be a little easier than uh, using your computer. Um, we have eight people joined so far. All right, we have a few more people. Just wait a little bit to see if anyone else wants to join. And if you don't want to join with us and play in the actual um, the hoot, you can just, you'll see the game happening anyway, and you can just shout out the answers at your screen at home uh, if you want to. Um, or, I don't know, maybe get folks around you in your house to play with you. Um, I don't know, if you have a cat or a dog, maybe they uh, want to participate in the challenge as well. Um, all right. So we are going to get, you know what, all right, we have about, we have almost 20 players, so you know what, let's get started with our All right, get ready. What is one thing volunteers at Great Gold? <laughs> All right, it looks like most people got that one. That was just a little, little fun question to kind of get you all used to uh, Kahoot and how it works. Um, so yeah, they don't unfortunately do the hokey pokey, or maybe they do, and Loyan just failed to mention it. I, I don't know. All right, so let's get going with our next question. See, oh, let's see who, oh, Birdie is at the top. So you do get points for answering the quickest, just so you know. Uh, so try to, try to get in there quick. All right, next question. Which of these birds commonly compete with turns for nesting? <laughs> see how we did. Okay, Birdie is still in the lead. All right, next question. Where do terns in New York typically lay their eggs? There's a lot of different places that terns lay their eggs, but uh, we're talking about New York. Are good. 
All right. Uh, oh, okay. So we have Sofer pulling in the lead. All right. Next question. Name that turn species. <laughs> All right, Buster, you got that one too. We couldn't, we couldn't fool you. All right, and let's see one more. According to researchers, where do common terns and the Azores spend the winter? <laughs> Okay. Oh, turny. <laughs> okay. All right. How fast can turns fly? Last question. This is a tough one. I think Aurora mentioned it right at the beginning. All right, so let's see how you all did. Laura, pulling out ahead. Oh, no, Laura in third place. <laughs> all right, Miles. And Turney, well, that's fitting. You had to have Turney win, uh, <laughs> win the, uh, the whole thing. Um, very, very fitting indeed. All right, thank you all for uh, joining us for that little quiz. Um, that was a lot of fun. We're almost done here today, but we have one last little treat for you guys. Um, Autumn is going to come back and join us and just share um, a poem that she wrote about turns um, as sort of a closing reflection to uh, close out our, our turn festival. So Autumn, uh, hi. Hey, hey everybody. I hope you guys had a good time. Um, I wrote this piece for this year's Turn Festival because I knew um, I would miss being able to be there in person, even though it's been a really great festival and everybody's been really awesome. Um, and it's about flying and missing someone and being lost and found and, um, and hope, you know, and it's very short. So here it goes. Their edge honed wings slip, snick. A sudden swift slick glint, slicing the sun black blinding blue. And Kiar, Kiar, there, a flash of red spike bill. And Kiar, chick, her body a fleet portrait of the sun sweet sky. And Kiar, Kiar, the one left behind, his hairline receding like my long gone Uncle Ray. And I, Kiar, Kiar, a snicker snort chuckle at the image of my round Sicilian uncle taking to the sky. But there, his brothers and sisters boastful, tilt their head in brazen brag while on the knife wing diff and swoop and at the last cry home to wives and husbands nesting on the pier. Make room, make way. My old uncle has found his way at last. Thanks, Autumn. Cool. That was lovely, thank you. Um, all right, so now uh, we are done with the seventh annual It's Your Turn Festival. Thank you all so much for joining us uh, for this virtual festival. I know it's not quite the same. Um, um, I don't think the festival's boundaries are the measures, but this is what uh, it would be like, you know, seven years later. But it's so great to all our partners for joining us and spreading the word about this wonderful little seabird. We love them very much, and um, we hope that you all have learned a little bit today. Um, just so you know, we will be having a virtual shorebird festival on August 22nd, so be sure to follow New York City Audubon on social media. I know that's been dropped in the comments, but we're at NYC Audubon 
on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, and you can go to our website, um, www.nycaudubon.org, um, and sign up for our EGRET email newsletter to get more details on that festival once they have uh, been announced. We hope to see you there. And um, that's it. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Bye.